All right, we'll get started. Welcome everyone to the September 15th regular meeting of the Transportation Commission. The Transportation Commission is conducting this meeting from city council chambers and staff are complying with the current regulations of the California Department of Public Health and Cal OSHA for safe indoor meetings. As a courtesy and technology permitting, members of the public may continue to provide live remote oral public comment via the city's Zoom video conferencing platform. However, the city cannot guarantee that the public's access to teleconferencing technology will be uninterrupted and technical difficulties may occur from time to time. Members of the public desiring to provide comments at the meeting are encouraged to attend the meeting in person. The meeting can be accessed by Zoom using meeting ID 878-1299-6229 and the passcode is 433618. If you wish to join by phone, dial 669-900-6833. Um, with that, um, Secretary, would you please call roll? Sure. Uh, Commissioner German. Here. Commissioner Reese. Here. Commissioner Salcido. Here. Youth Member Yao. Here. Vice Chair Ash. Here. And Chair Cagle. Here. Thank you. And I also want to take a moment to welcome our new youth member, Angie Yao. Thank you so much for joining us. We're looking forward to having you as part of the discussions. Okay, item number two, we're going to move on to public communications. Uh, this portion of the meeting is reserved for comment on items not on the agenda. Under the Brown Act, the Commission cannot act on items raised during public communications, but may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed, request clarification, or refer the item to staff. At this time, I'll open up uh, this item for public comment. Do we have any mem members of the public wishing to comment on anything not on the agenda? It doesn't appear we have anybody here to comment on items not on the agenda. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, then we will move on to item three, which is our consent calendar. Um, we'll do adoption of the July 21st, 2022 meeting minutes. Do I have a motion for approval of these minutes? Second. All right. Thank you very much. Did you get that, Secretary? Thank you. Okay, Commissioner German. Okay, Commissioner German, do we have a vote? Uh, it's roll, roll call vote. Approve. <laughs> okay. Uh, Reese, Commissioner Reese? Aye. Commissioner Salcido? Aye. Abstain, mm -hmm. since I was absent. Approve. Thank you. Aye. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you very much. We'll move on to item number four. Um, we have four items for consideration tonight. Uh, the first is our uh, social service transportation program. And at this time, I invite staff to give a presentation, please. Good evening, commissioners. Um, my name is Cassandra Guerrero. I am the office assistant over at Civic Park Community Center, um, also known as the Senior Center. Um, I also oversee the day-to-day -day operations for the Social Services Transportation Program. Um, so our transportation program has uh, been in service for over 40 years um, in various forms. Um, it's funded by the TransPAC grant. Uh, we provide over 3,000 rides to, per year to majority seniors. However, this year we recently expanded our program uh, to, for adults 18 and up with uh, adaptive needs. Um, and it's mainly for uh, Walnut Creek residents. Um, 
The program supports these individuals in maintaining the independence by providing rides to medical appointments, grocery stores, activities, programs, and uh, so much more, including family visits, um, friend visits. Um, our program offers three types of transportation options. Um, these programs kind of are, correspond with our um, with the three stages of aging process. So the first stage um, is independence. The second stage is uh, inter-independence. And then the third stage is dependency. Um, so the three options that we have available uh, for our members are, is our minibus program and our Lyft self-access pass, as well as our Lyft concierge pass. And majority of our um, individuals that are part of our program don't often um, qualify for paratransit or other programs. So we do fill in those gaps. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump right into our minibus program. So our minibus program um, has been in service since 1973. The minibus uh, serves our what I would like to call our stage three in, um, participants, which is our um, ind individuals that need that extra assistance that they're not able to do the day-to-day, -day, um, everyday tasks that require of them, and that can include uh, scheduling a ride. Um, often these individuals that are using our program, um, their children are calling in for them, and some as far as North Carolina to uh, schedule these rides for them. Our minibus uh, program has two uh, city vehicles that we use. Majority of the time, we are using our seven passenger bus. However, if we do have those one days where we only have one passenger, one round trip, uh, we do encourage our volunteers to uh, utilize our five passenger uh, electric vehicle that we have just so that we're conserving energy and being sustainable. Um, we do operate this, pro this program is free. Um, so our participants that do participate in this program, um, they don't pay any cost for this. Um, our program operates Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. This program is volunteer based. Um, so a lot of the times if we don't have a driver, we do tend to cancel that day. Um, but for the most part, we have a pretty consistent volunteer program where um, the volunteers are usually the same volunteers every day, every week. Um, in order to be eligible for this program, you do have to be a Walnut Creek resident. You have to either be a Lyft member or a Walnut Creek Senior Club member. Um, again, we did expand um, our program to include adults 18 and up with adaptive needs, so they are able to utilize this program as well. And then this program is really um, for those who need that extra assistance getting in and out of the vehicle, or maybe they have a walker that they need assistance getting into that vehicle, um, or they might have dementia, um, and they really need that extra door-to-door -door service. So the way uh, we schedule our minibus rides, um, or the locations that we go to, we do go to specific locations within Walnut Creek. Um, and this was based off of frequent locations that we have pulled from past data. Most of our locations that we do uh, take our riders to are medical offices, grocery stores, uh, Walnut Creek Arts and Recreation locations. And then um, we do have availability to maybe that one-off ride if, if we do have available um, drivers that day to take them to maybe a friend's house or a family member's house, or maybe they want to go to their granddaughter's recital. Um, so we do have those one-offs, and those are available based on availability um, in our schedule as well as, as well as if it's within our route. Um, to set up a minibus ride, riders are required to call in one to two days in advance, Monday through Friday from 9 to 10 a.m., um, and they need to provide their information, um, their name, the locations that they're going to, the time of their rides that they need, and oftentimes, again, it's the children that are calling in for these individuals. Um, 
And then the dispatcher inputs the ride information into a Google form where we keep this um, on a database. Um, and then from there, our transportation coordinator creates the schedule for our volunteers, and then we create the routes, um, and then we get those to our volunteers. And then from there, uh, our transportation staff is available for any occurrence that may happen, if it's an emergency or if something happens. Um, and so in order for us to really create our minibus to be efficient, um, we do use uh, Google Maps, which is a free uh, platform. Um, Google Maps allows us to input 15 locate up to 15 locations. This is how we're able to create ride shares. And I think it's important that we are creating these ride shares because a lot of the times um, we've had positive feedback from our riders. Um, oftentimes our riders aren't going out to socialize. So this is the only time they're able to socialize with other riders or other people other than going to medical office. And then one of the great things about Google Maps is that um, we're able to send this off to our volunteer phone where they're able to um, input it in their phone and then have the directions available for them for these routes. And then going into our Lyft program, so we have two types of memberships. We have our Lyft Self Access Pass and our Lyft Concierge Pass. And the hours of operation is Monday through Sunday from 8.30 to 9 p.m. And to be eligible for this uh, program, uh, you have to be a Walnut Creek resident, be 60 years of age or 18 and up with adaptive needs, and then be comfortable getting in and out of the vehicle without assistance. So our Lyft Self Access Pass, I like to call it our stage one, um, which is for our members who are independent, who are capable of doing everyday tasks, can get in and out of vehicles, can um, schedule their own rides. Uh, this membership is a $25 annual fee. Um, it's we provide 16, 16 one-way rides, which equates to eight round-trip rides per month that reoccur in their Lyft app automatically. And then the rider pays $5 up front for a fixed rate. Um, and then Walnut Creek will uh, pay up to $10 per ride, any overage cost uh, the rider incurs. Um, Rides are available within Walnut Creek and 25 locations outside of Walnut Creek. Um, and those are specific locations that we have chosen based off of past data. Um, most of our locations are medical, um, shopping, and set, uh, community centers. Um, we do offer, for those individuals who have never used the Lyft app, a one-on-one gui -on -one guided um, tutorial that typically takes between 10 to 30 minutes for us to provide that, depending on the individual. And then we also fi offer financial assistance through our Walnut Creek scholarships. Um, these are a few images, um, what our Lyft Self Access uh, recipient receives. So on the left, the image on the left is when you, it's a welcome page, which we call our splash page. Um, so you receive this within your Lyft app. It just welcomes them to our program and it provides their details, which is the middle image. Um, our program is geofenced. So our Lyft pass does not apply when an individual say wants to go to San Ramon because it doesn't meet our criteria. Um, and then the last, uh, the right side image is what our re recipients are receiving um, in order to make a scheduled ride. Um, so our Lyft Concierge Pass, uh, I like to call it our Stage 2 Pass. It's for those who, individuals who are interdependent. Um, and those individuals t can do some ta everyday tasks on their own, but they're not able to do all everyday tasks. Um, and this typically is not able to schedule rides, um, but they're still able to get in and out of vehicles on their own. Um, this is a $45 annual fee. It six, provides 16 one-way rides per month, which equates to eight rides round trip. Um, the city pays full price for all of our rides, um, and then rides are available within Wana Creek in the 25 locations that we have chosen. Um, 
We use the Lyft Concierge platform, which is an online based, um, and it's through our transportation staff that schedules these rides. Um, in order to request a ride, you do need to provide your first and last name, your phone up, your pickup and drop off address, as well as the day and time that you need and any notes that the driver needs to know about. Um, and then some great features about this is that um, it provides language preference. So some of our individuals that we have, that we serve, um, speak a different language. Um, with this, we're able to choose a language and it can, it's not always guaranteed, um, but we can um, connect you with a driver that speaks that specific language. Um, another great um, feature of the Lyft Concierge is that we can view live rides at any point in time. So if our drivers and riders can't connect, we can go ahead and connect them. Um, and then we are able to also contact the drivers. And then just to kind of end our presentation, we have a few testimonies. This is Crystal. Uh, she uses our Lyft and Minibus program, and she's also a financial aid recipient. And this is what she had to say about her program. I love the Lyft and Minibus program. It is so good for me because I do not have transportation to get me to where I need to go. This program has helped me a lot. It actually saved my life before I was not able to get to places to buy food or make it to doctor's appointments. Now I can go to Ranch 99 and buy food I like to make and I can attend activities like bingo at the community center. The staff, Cassie and Bailey, are so wonderful. I love them like my family because they are always there to help me. Um, this individual, she actually does not have any family living here, but her daughter in Chicago signed her up for our program. So now she uses it all the time and comes to the community center and thanks us every single day. And this is Barbara Wadley. She's a firecracker. Um, I've been used, uh, this is what she has to say. She, she is, only uses our minibus program. Um, so I've been using the minibus uh, for doctor's appointments. Before that, I use public transit. The minibus is such a peace of mind. The drivers are very nice. The staff is very accommodating. I have not one complaint. The locations are working out well, too. It really has made my life easier. I don't mind taking public transit, but the minibus makes my life so much more simple. It really changed my life in a big way. And that's all I have for you guys today. Um, questions, comments? Thank you so much for that presentation. And you go by Cassie as well. Yes. I take it so the, those kudos were for you in the presentation. Congratulations. Thanks. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, are there any questions from commissioners? Commissioner German? Um, yeah, so we advertise it several different ways. One in our recreation newsletter. In the nutshell, also in our weekly reports um, and on our social media. Any other questions from commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Reese. Um, I'm just curious how the how the integration has gone with the age differences between the 18 and ups and the seniors in the minibuses. Has that worked out well? Yeah. Um, so. We have a couple individuals um, that are under the age of 60. Um, they don't use the minibus often. Um, they are also Lyft members, so they only use the minibus to balance their rides. So if they run out of rides, they're always encouraged to utilize the minibus. But we haven't had any issues. Okay. And a uh, second question. You mentioned that sometimes the minibus is canceled. Uh, so what happens uh, since the rides are planned a day or two in advance? What happens to the... Yeah, so we always incur... So um, we do have a staff member that is on site that if anything is not able to happen and they're free, they'll typically drive the minibus. However, we do switch them all over to the lift um, if they're able to utilize it. Um, if not, then oftentimes the seniors are okay with it. Um, they really like the volunteers that they're going with, so they typically prefer to just cancel the ride and then they'll make another appointment just to have that volunteer as their driver. Anyone else? Commissioner Salcido? 
Are all of the drivers for the minibus volunteers, or are any of them staff? No, all of them are volunteers. And I, I can't remember if you had this earlier in the presentation, but it, uh, what are the hours of operation? For the minibus? Um, so it's Monday through Thursday from 8 uh, to 3, but on during the summertime, we tend to include uh, Fridays. Okay. And how... How long has the program been around? Um, so the minibus has been around since 1973, oh. but recently in 2018 we expanded to Lyft. And has it has it grown over time, or what has yes. been sort of the utilization of the service? Yeah. So our minibus has. Um, I, our transportation has grown significantly um, now that we have Lyft because we're able to reach out to more individuals, especially those who um, are in our stage one category where they're still independent, but sometimes they might have those minor mental and physical declines that may need to um, take other transportation. Um, so it has grown significantly since then. Also with um, a lot of our program has changed this year. So recently our minibus was you pick up one rider, you take them to their location, you pick up another rider, you take them to that location. Um, since we've expanded we've also and started using the Google Maps, we're able to create more ride shares and provide more rides to those individuals. So it definitely has expanded. And has the, it seems like the program has been pretty successful then. Have there been thoughts on how to expand this to other use cases? Yes, um, we are in the process and doing other things. Um, we haven't yet decided in what we're doing, but we're hoping to expand it more. Yeah. Ash, Ash? Uh, I think a lot of these have been asked and answered now. Uh, so give me a second. Um, how do you partner with doctor's offices? Like in reverse, right? Instead of a senior calling you, what happens if... Um, I saw some of your stops like Kaiser and the Shade Lens, right? Does Kaiser call you ever? Yes. Or Okay, so they're yes. aware of you. The majority of the bigger places are aware of you guys. And yes, they are. Um, John Muir connects with us a lot um, and makes these appointments as well, um, as, well as well as Kaiser. Um, and then we do have some dental offices that connect with us if they're um, – patient says, oh, I need a ride, and they'll often give us a call and s let us know that this individual may need a ride. Do they qualify our, for our program? And if they do, we often um, connect with these individuals. And then how's the, how's the budget um, money? Is it, like, stable? Was it more because of COVID stimulus? Are we worried about cutting off some of this expansion? Or um. I might have to defer that to my manager who's not here, and I can get back to you on that. But um, we have made a lot of changes within our program. Prior to this, during COVID, our riders had unlimited access to rides. Um, recently, we restricted by adding the geofence to the, um, to the lift, self-access. And then we also limited it by um, limiting rides uh, to 16. And um, we've also before they didn't have to pay any of their rides. Now for Lyft self-access, they do have to pay $5 as well as a membership fee. So we have reduced our costs, but with inflation, it's kind of been stable, so. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, and my, my question was gonna be around capacity and room to grow, but I think you kind of answered that and that you're looking at growth areas. And But I guess with the current, um, with the current vehicles and resources that you have in place, are you are you near capacity? Is is there room to grow right now? Given oh yeah, there's absolutely room to grow. Good, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I hope we get the word out and utilize all that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, at this point, um, I'm going to open this up for public comment. Is there anybody on the line for public comment? We do have one uh, hand raised, uh, Jan. I'm going to bring you in. Okay. Jan, you're on. 
Okay. <laughs> Can't say anything. Um, Mike, well, I have two questions. One has to do with where would you find the list of the 25 uh, locations, uh, if it's on a website or something. And the other would be, I, I understand pretty easily if they're picking you up and you have a set time for an appointment, but you know, sometimes appointments run over or, or you know, or whatever. And so how do they get picked up uh, in a reasonably, you know, reasonable time once they're done? Can I refer that question? Appointment's you, over. Kathy? What was that? Can, can I have you answer that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for those 25 locations, you can find them online. You can also pick up a packet um, in, at the Civic Park Community Center. And I believe we do have some here at City Hall as well. Um, and then as far as if a doctor's appointment runs late, um, because we do have transportation staff on site, um, those individuals who do tend to have their um, rides run late, they're always able to call us and we can change the time of those rides if need be. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, and then I do wanna say oftentimes our volunteers, um, if we have a gap and we don't have other riders, our volunteers are always nearby. Uh, what is the phone number? Can we provide that? Yes, it's, do you know our phone number? Reservation line? Do you want to come up to it? <laughs> Hold on, I think we have it. Uh, well, while you do that, I did uh, not give the instructions for providing comments. So if there's anybody else in the audience who would like to provide comment, please um, fill out a speaker card and approach the lectern. And if there's anyone else online, um, I will say if you press, uh, use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only to provide comment. And when brought in, we'll have you state your name and city of residence for the record, and you'll have two minutes. So if there's anyone else, just have those instructions out there. And did that provide enough time to get the number? Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so there's two numbers you can call. So for reservations, um, you can call 925-256-3533. And then if for any reason you need to change, make changes to your ride, you can call 925-943-5852. All right. And to sign up is that number. Wonderful. Thank you, Jan, for being here. Are there, is there anybody else? There are no more uh, public comments. Okay, great. Uh, are there any commissioner comments? Uh, Commissioner Salcedo. Um, I just uh, thank you for the presentation. I think it's a really great program, and especially in in a city like Walnut Creek, where we do have kind of a, a suburban development where we don't have the um, the density in a lots of parts of our community um, to provide fast, efficient. Um, public transit all the time um, and it and the stops are kind of far and few between um, so I think it's a great service for that and I'd love to see how this could be expanded to other use cases like you are exploring um, for particularly for for um, lower income residents um, and uh, to be able to have more access to things um, and and just in general I think it'd be a great uh, a great way to kind of incentivize people to think of other ways to get to the BART station or downtown um, and not have to rely so much on parking and being safe about driving <laughs> under certain circumstances. Um, so, um, but, I, but I appreciate the presentation and learning more about this. I wasn't even really aware of some of these programs, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and, and I hope that there's, there's more we can do in terms of this type of innovative thinking and innovative partnerships with um, companies like Lyft. I think it's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to encourage you as you look at other groups, maybe look at like 12 to like 16 uh, year olds that need help to certain activities such as Parks and Rec activities or maybe like their school after school activities. Um, so we're narrowing where we're bringing them, but I know it's an issue like with the kids getting home or getting to Heather Farms to do synchronized swimming or whatever. So that would be something I'd look at. That's it. All right. 
I don't have any comments, so I think that wraps us up. Um, thank you so much, Cassie, okay. for your presentation. We appreciate it. I enjoyed learning about the programs as well. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Okay. At this time, we'll go on to item B, Safe Routes to School Study. Um, I invite staff to come on up and give their presentation, please. Okay, good evening. Oh no, uh oh. We've got a little bit of a technical difficulty. It's not a true meeting without a technical difficulty, I feel like, and I think Mercury's in retrograde, so we'll just blame it on that. <laughs> That was fast back in business. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. I'm Smidar Boardman. I'm the traffic engineer for the city. And I will be talking to, to you today um, about our Safe Routes to School study that we have officially kicked off as of earlier this week. A uh, quick overview, we'll be going through some background information, uh, goals and desired outcomes from the study, some of the details or scope of work that will be included, our schedule and next steps. So background, Safe Routes to School is a comprehensive and proven approach to increase walking and biking to school with the goals of reducing congestion and harmful pollutants around schools and increasing the safety and physical activity of students. So why are we here? Uh, a few years ago, uh, a strategic, a transportation strategic plan was brought through this commission, but also brought to um, planning commission, city council, um, surrounding a transportation demand management uh, strategy is for, for the city. And the intent of transportation demand management is to try and reduce uh, congestion by getting people out of cars and into other modes of transportation um, through different encouragement. Um, one of these strategies, which was strategy eight, is to promote safe routes to school. So we're embarking on that. And um, so pieces of, of that strategy will be incorporated into that, into this study. Um, and so we're looking at the partners, infrastructure, and parental engagement pieces. So goals and desired outcomes. First and foremost, sustainability. Uh, this aligns with one of the council's priorities as well. Uh, we're looking to increase school trips uh, made via active, so walking or biking, or shared transportation, so carpooling um, or transit, and making those viable everyday options. From a safety aspect, uh, we want to improve the pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure and, um, and increase student and parent confidence in what we um, provide in terms of safe space for those kids to be able to walk and bike safely to school. And then lastly, but definitely not least, uh, communication, collaboration, and education. We want to maintain open communication um, with our stakeholders, and I'll get into those key stakeholders in a minute, um, but then strengthen and leverage some of our existing partnerships that exist out there. We do have a Safe Routes to School program uh, through uh, 511 Contra Costa, and so they provide, it's called Street, uh, Street Smarts Mount Diablo. Um, but they provide more of the educational materials and um, the, the rodeos, the bike rodeos, and that kind of um, uh, service to schools and students. Uh, and then engage and empower those key stakeholders. And then, of course, uh, one of our products that we're looking to provide is some accessible educational materials that would be um, helpful for both students and parents to be able to understand. 
uh, for our tasks, we'll be engaging with school administrators, staff, parents, um, other partners. That's some feedback that we're looking for from the commission to potentially, are, you know, are we missing anybody here? Uh, from a data collection standpoint, we're gonna be looking at what our existing infrastructure is, what do we have around those schools, the existing crossing guard locations, and then we're also going to be recording that crazy pickup drop-off period, um, and we're actually utilizing drone footage, and that's only for the schools within the city boundaries. Um, and I'll go through those schools um, on the next slide. Uh, we'll be identifying barriers, so we're gonna be performing walking audits, that's what we call them, um, but basically we're out there, on the streets, walking through where, um, watching the kids walk and bike to school so we can see what they're experiencing in terms of any hurdles or um, any other barriers to getting them to school. And then ultimately recommending some improvements, so those solutions that would create safe connections, um, and then also identifying the best locations for crossing guards as appropriate. And then again, those, those materials, so providing those educational maps for students and for parents so they can figure out what's the best way for me to walk or bike to school. So here are the schools that have been selected as part of this study. Um, you'll see a few under Mount Diablo Unified. We've got Bancroft, uh, Valley Verde, Walnut Acres, Foothill and Northgate. Um, from Walnut Creek School District, we are looking at Buena Vista, Merwood, and then Parkmead and Tice Creek kind of share a campus. Uh, Walnut Heights and then Walnut Creek Intermediate and I'll point to those those stars the asterisks sometimes um, Community members don't realize this, but those schools are actually technically located within the county um, and so uh, part of that is what we wanted to do here is that we understand and Acknowledge that we have students who do live in Walnut Creek who are attending these schools and we want to make sure that we are providing infrastructure so that those kids can still choose to walk or bike regardless of what that city boundary is. Um, and then from San Ramon Valley Unified uh, is Alamo Elementary and uh, Alcalan is Union, Union High, we've got Los Lomas. So schedule, um, we're in the midst of our kickoff meetings. They started this week. Um, we're discussing kind of the specific goals and then identifying any issues with those specific locations. Um, those kickoff meetings right now are with uh, principals, a PTA member. Uh, we have facilities from the district um, attending those as well. Um, and then we have our consultant and uh, staff, city staff. Uh, moving into October, November, and this is supposed to be before Thanksgiving hits, uh, we'll be observing these school drop-off and pickup times and then um, seeing what kind of typical behavior is occurring during that time period and then collecting that drone footage, which I think is actually in progress right now. And then in the spring, we'll be um, identifying those recommendations, so those infrastructure improvements and uh, crossing guard locations, and maybe other circulation improvements that might be found. Uh, from a next step standpoint, so those recommendations, we would take those uh, infrastructure improvements and incorporate it into the capital investment program, which is due to be updated over the next several months. Um, and then we'd establish those new crossing guard locations. Um, from a funding source perspective, we'd be trying to see what we can uh, do in terms of finding funding to, to help support you know, all this infrastructure. Um, we do have traffic impact fees. Maybe there's general fund opportunity, um, federal, state, and local grants, which are competitive. Um, maybe there's something else that we haven't thought of. And then um, for crossing guard locations, we do utilize uh, general fund money. In the past, we've used the um, pandemic funds, which I don't recall what those are called right now, but it was basically pandemic money that came back to the city and that helped to fund some of the crossing guards. Um, and then also some of the school PTAs are actually funding uh, crossing guards or partially cro uh, funding them. So with that, I'm here to answer any questions and comments. Great. But I'm gonna move over there so I can let people in on Zoom. <laughs> that sounds Thanks. good, double duty. Thank you, Svidar. Um, are there any questions from any commissioners? Commissioner Drummond, do you have a question?
I need to be. What that foot on. They're right next to each other. That foothill and Walnut Acres? Yes. Are right next to each other? I see, I see Walnut Acres now. He's good. He just wanted to see the slide again, I think. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Anyone else? Commissioner Reese? Thanks. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, what schools are not included, and why were they not included? I'm going to bring up uh, Brianna Byrne, who's our associate traffic engineer, to answer that question. So the only public school in Walnut Creek boundary that was not included was Indian Valley. Um, we decided not to include that school just because the school itself is in city, but most of the road leading up to it's in county. So we're going to take a different approach specifically for that school and do something special for them. But every, every oh. other school in Walnut Creek is on the list. Okay, thanks. Um, and uh, I'm curious about why the drones are only in the city and why they couldn't be done for the schools that are in the unincorporated areas as well. Yeah, so, you know, we do have a finite amount of money to you know put into this study and any kind of specific circulation impacts that might be occurring at the school itself are in county in the county land so the all of these schools that you see that are um on here their yeah their whole drop-off pickup activity is fully occurring on county roads, we wouldn't be able to, you know, we could provide recommendations, but what I will tell you is that we are working with county traffic engineering staff so that they've been, and they're involved in all of the meetings that are um, for the schools that are within the county. So we're, we're working together. We're not gonna be collecting that drone footage, but um, you know, we can always, while we're doing the walking, performing the walking audits, we will still be um, noting those observations regardless. We just okay. yeah. won't be taking that drone footage. Yeah. Right. The, the, this, you, you're not, it's not your jurisdiction on those roads and therefore you're not, you, you, can't, you can't be proactive necessarily. It's more difficult. Okay. I got that. Um, and I guess the other question I was curious about is the drones, um, they're just one day of observation, I would imagine, because of cost. Are they done at the same day that you do the walking audits, or were you able to sync that up at all? No, they're not. Yeah, we're, we're doing that data collection right now, actually, and, um, and then the walking audits are still to be scheduled and will probably occur in the next month or so. But that's, I mean... Yeah. There's something to be said about having that observation on the same day, of course, but I actually kind of like the idea of having a little more breadth of data um, from what we see on the ground. Plus, um, you know, a lot of times what happens with these walking audits is that you have a lot of people who are focused on the hubbub activity that's happening right at the school because you're trying to um, mm -hmm. document everything that's going on there. And then you miss maybe some of the outlying um, issues that might be occurring, which is really what we're trying to capture is that half mile or quarter mile radius where we're trying to capture those kids who are walking or biking. And so that's kind of the, that's kind of the idea. And will you be able to look at the drone footage before you do the walking audits then? Is yeah. That, that's your idea. That's great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Salcido. Um, this is kind of a, a clarification and follow up to the question about um, the schools that were not included in the study area. Um, there are a couple of uh, public charter schools in the city. Um, so Eagle Peak Montessori is one of them and it's actually on the campus of Northgate High School. I don't know if that would be kind of part of that study area because their start times are, are somewhat overlapping in terms of the traffic. Um, and then, uh, and it's on kind of the side where people like, it's, it's not on the main entrance side. Um, and then I don't know about um, 
Contra Costa School for Performing Arts in the Shadelands as well. Um, and there, in addition to that, there are some private preschools that are fairly sizable for, um, for, for a preschool um, that are also just all in that one area um, with KLA and Springfield and Little Flowers. <laughs> They're like all in the same area. I don't know if that, that would, if that was a, ever a consideration or not. Yeah, we're really focused on the public schools and since, and again, this is, it's safe routes to school. And so we're really focused on walking and biking. And so the, the preschools, especially, I mean, that's all, it's all about drop off. I mean, we're open to exploring kind of the circulation issues that come with, you know, the, the daycares and the preschools, but this really is the focus on looking at the public schools that serve the community and, um, seeing how we can get people out of cars and walking or biking to, to school. You good? Vice Chair um, Do you look at, when you're looking at the sidewalks and doing the walk, do you consider uh, the ramps or where the lack of ramps are, the ADA compliance? Because when you're talking about walking and biking, that makes it easier. Yeah, we're definitely looking at um, ADA curb ramps as part of the infrastructure, um, taking in what that existing condition looks like. Okay, thanks. Yes, our youth member, Angie L. Oh, I just wanted to ask, um, are there any efforts to also educate drivers on how to be more careful and alert, just navigating around students if more students were to walk and bike? Yeah, so we actually put out a campaign on um, our safety sloth um, little image that we push out on Nextdoor at least. Um, we're really trying to do some more social media campaigns around, um, slow, you know, go with the slow and, um, and slowing down, but especially during the school time uh, period. We also had something come out in the nutshell recently about, you know, schools are back in session. Please be aware of, you know, kids parents, bicycles, um, and, and the like. So we're really trying to move forward on that education piece, but we know that we have a long way to go on that. All right, any other questions? Yes, Commissioner German. Sorry, just clarification on Commissioner Salzio's question about good in Sorry, in good private schools, I take it your answer is the same for brain school. And yes, it is. Yeah, that's yeah, that's right. So with private schools, it's a different type of pattern because we're not necessarily serving just local students. Where you know that's I mean the private schools have a much more expansive geography. We're talking about a lot more it's likely that more people might be driving or maybe they're shuttling from BART, that kind of thing. So this is truly focused on the public school serving that, that um, catchment area uh, nearby the school. Okay, I'm just curious. And one more question. I think this is a great, this is a survey, right? Let's suppose that you find Foothill needs physical changes. You have to budget for those separately, right? Would we have the different schools? You would budget. budget. This is only meant to find out to flow. Once you find the problem to make the changes that you wanted to make, you have to put in the account program, correct? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last bit of your question. Okay. This is a study. If you identify changes you want to make, you have to budget for those are late, right? Yes, we would be putting, uh, hopefully budgeting money through the capital investment program to fund infrastructure improvements for whatever recommendations come out of out of the study. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? Okay, um, the only thing I was gonna ask is about the engagement with, um, Staff and parents, especially the folks that travel, you know, to school every day. Um, are, what what kind of engagement will be taking place? Will you be doing like surveys or um, you know soliciting ideas, um, that kind of thing? Yeah, 
So at this point in time, um, we're at like this kickoff stage. We've been inviting uh, PTA members, um, either one person or speaking with the principal, if they have like a real like a safety advocate that they know of or multiples. They've um, they've been participating in these kickoff conversations, where we go over, you know, like where the kids are entering the school, like where do they see these issues, and then that's kind of where we've been getting a lot of feedback. Like the parents so far have been great at providing feedback. Um, and also as part of these kickoff meetings, we are, you know, asking if they would like us to speak at PTA meetings. So we are engaging that, that parent platform. Okay. And we have a couple more schedule or a couple of PTA meetings already scheduled. Okay, great. Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, one more question. Commissioner Salcido. Sorry, I have one more. Um, I, I was wondering, um, if there is, have, has been any research or if there are studies on the impact of crossing guards and how much crossing guards improve safety for the students and also any risks to the crossing guards themselves since I think most of us are probably familiar with the incident that happened in Lafayette that was quite tragic. Um, so I was just curious to understand more about like, I know people feel better and it, it's sort of a nice just kind of from a service perspective it's nice to have that person helping cross but what is the actual um, impact from a safety perspective um, as far as we're aware um, there isn't really necessarily like a study that can quantify how much safer it is to have that person there but yeah we, we can follow up with that information okay any other questions brought up? Okay. Um, so at this time, it's time for public comment. Is there anyone in line to uh, provide public comment? We have one person online. Okay. Two, excuse me. All right, so if you're joining us by Zoom, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only. Uh, when you are brought in for comment, please state your name and city of residence for the record. You'll have two minutes to provide your comment. Jan, I'm going to bring you in now. Welcome back, Jan. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Jan Warren, I live in Walnut Creek. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about this. And as a matter of fact, I've been wondering whatever happened to it. I heard about it several years ago and um, <laughs> we went through COVID and uh, the kids were having a great time out riding their bikes everywhere and learning how to ride their bikes because there weren't many cars. Uh, and I do see a young man uh, every day past my, uh, when I'm out sweeping, uh, going to school with his instrument on the back of his bike. Don't see as many bike riders now. Um, I would uh, like to know, uh, you're gonna do this study, will you come back in January to give a, a, an update uh, or, or when will that happen? And what is, is there any kind of possibility to work with the schools? I know everyone has their First Amendment rights or whatever rights they have. But a lot of times, you know, people, uh, parents pull, pull in right up by the school and they drop off kids. And um, if there was the, on the right-hand side where, or, uh, where kids are driving, riding their bikes, if people didn't park there during the drop-off time, um, if they, you know, plop, uh, dropped it off a side street, it would, you know, be safer for the kids to be riding their bikes because cars, you know, uh, you know, whether it's opening a door or just people pulling out, it, it's kind of dangerous. And um, I recently rode my bike over, I, I'm a block from Valley Verde. I rode over just to the YB library. And uh, of course, the biggest thing there is you would have younger kids and uh, the older kids riding bikes and crossing that big uh, busy street. So um, look forward to um, what y'all come up with. Thanks. Thank you, Jan. Appreciate your comments. And next. We have no more members of the public wishing to provide comment. Okay. Um, are there any commissioner comments? <laughs> yes, Angie, I'll please. 
So I just want to say that I really appreciate this um, safe routes to school, especially because I actually bike to school, and I've noticed some areas in infrastructure that could be improved, and I've actually like fallen off my bike because of the cracks in the road. And I know that many of my classmates would be more encouraged to walk and bike if safety was improved. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, youth member Yao, for your comments, and I hope you were okay. <laughs> Any other comments? Commissioner Reese? Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I, I would really be interested um, in hearing about the effectiveness of the drone footage and how you used it and how, uh, how it helped or didn't help in your um, analysis. It's a very unique uh, modern way of collecting data, so I, I would appreciate that. Um, I also really appreciate that you were that you're being proactive with the county. Um, so often we have situations where um, we say, "Well, that's a county road, so we can't do anything about that because we're the city." Um, I'm not saying Walnut Creek or Contra Costa County specifically, but just in general jurisdictional issues oftentimes uh, lead to less safe environments because uh, you don't get the cooperation. So I really appreciate that you are looking at on your, on your audits that you are gonna look at um, unincorporated streets even though you don't have control and the power to implement improvements. I think uh, those walking audits are a really great way to get information that you could at least give to the county and coordinate with them and maybe come up with a, a, a funding, a shared funding mechanism in order to, to do those improvements. I know the county is very large and they have limited resources and um, so it's difficult and so I hope that the city will be proactive because they are our students um, that are living uh, in Walnut Creek. Um, and I guess the last thing is that you made a comment at the very beginning, I think it was on the slide, about safe connections. And I know I keep bringing this up and always bringing it up, but really it's all about safe connections. It's about providing a continuous safe environment for uh, people uh, to, to use transportation, uh, whether it's a, a walking, biking, riding the bus, or in a car. I mean, face it, we car crashes happen too, and we need safe systems that um, that look at all aspects of transportation. And so, um, I always harp on this safe connections, but it's to me, for me, that's really important. Um, doing spot improvements helps, but it's then less safe between the spot improvements. If you can do continuous improvements, then you have a, a much better system for the community. So uh, thank you, and I look forward to hearing about your findings. Any other comments? Commissioner Salcido. Um, so I also appreciate um, that the city is, is investing in this study and looking at ways to improve routes to our schools, um, especially as a parent of a school-aged child. Um, and uh, so my daughter actually goes to Eagle Beach Montessori, which is, is a public school. Um, it's chartered, but it's a, it's a public school um, chartered with Mount Diablo Unified School District. And, um, and while it does pull from a broader geography, there are actually quite a few families who bike to school, including myself. <laughs> um, and uh, it's quite dangerous. Um, with some of the turns and they're in these residential neighborhoods, there are a lot of intersections where there are no um, stop signs <laughs> and cars just drive very fast because people are rushing to get to school on time um, and or rushing to get to work after school drop off. And so um, it's, I feel like I'm putting my life in danger <laughs> every time I bring my daughter to school. Um, and I had the same experience um, last year when she attended Walnut Acres Elementary um, because there are so many places where the sidewalks just randomly end um, and there are just a lot of cars and a lot of traffic. Um, and so I think the more that we can do to 
reduce the amount of vehicular traffic going to the schools. That will make a huge difference in, in the level of feeling of safety and and just getting more of a critical mass of people who take alternative forms of transportation, I think will also help um, with just having better visibility for drivers because um, walkers and bicyclists are kind of outnumbered. And so um, it's it's harder to be seen by all of the cars that are passing by. Um, and so I, and I know that this is still kind of you're still evaluating, collecting data. Um, and I think in addition to um, the work that the staff is doing, which I think sounds great, um, there might be an opportunity to sort of crowdsource some data as well um, and really kind of get the, um, the parents' eye view of what drop-off is like <laughs> from different modes of transportation um, with their iPhones or a GoPro or something like that. I think it would be interesting to collect a lot of different perspectives from from different individuals because it's it's different every day um, and everyone has a slightly different route and different um, issues that they experience on their on their commute school, however that um, might take place. Um, and I also think it would be great um, while the staff is collecting the data to also have video of and you. Obviously, the drone will be collecting video. I don't know how much additional video staff will be collecting, but I think it would be great to assemble um, a showcase of kind of the experience and what some of the challenges are so that people really see and can understand why this is necessary and important, um, especially for the safety of children. Um, and then uh, I, I don't know. Um, if this has been uh, looked at at all, but I was really inspired by um, what parents are doing in Barcelona with the BC Boost, um, where it's like a bike bus, so they create routes um, and uh, where all the children bike to school together. And, um, and I think there are some interesting ideas out there that would make people start to feel more comfortable because I think right now there are so many places that are just really inhospitable. And so it's hard to take the leap to going to an alternative mode because it does feel very unsafe. And I've been doing this for the last uh, year plus. Um, and so I've gotten somewhat used to it, but it's still kind of scary at times when um, when people are driving a bit erratically and or, e or not even driving erratically, just not noticing um, pedestrians and bikes. Mm -hmm. Vice Chair Ash. Thanks. Um, so I'd like to see at some point like a best practice, like I assume you're doing research of other places along those lines. And so there might be a federal report that says these are best practices or some organization. So I'd love to, to know if you could share that with us. And then when you're done with the study and then when you guys have your your action steps, I'd love, you know, at those two points, if you can come back and share that with all of us so we can be a part of this process with you and, and see how it evolves, because uh, clearly people are passionate about it. Thanks. All right. Any other comments? Uh, Commissioner German. All right. To expand on the Commissioner Adler's comments, you you're going to go to the couple of fund that, that uh, make any of the changes that you find in this study. Can you come back to the commission? This should be high in the capital plan. And, you know, it normally takes 10 years. So this should be higher on the list. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. Really appreciate it. And this is so incredibly important to families in our community. Um, I don't see a lot of mention of transit, and maybe that's not included in this, but I do know there are, are some high school kids and some older kids that do utilize that. So I think it'd be interesting to observe that as well. And it helps foster transit riders down the road, I think, too, and like making that a part of getting around town and to and from school. Um, I love fostering the next generation of transit riders as much as we can. Um, and uh, I can't wait to hear the results of this and hope that, you know, what comes of it, we can 
foster those who are on the cusp of trying to make changes around their uh, commuting habits. And yeah, thank you very much for your work. Appreciate it. And with that, we are going to go on to item C to uh, our local road safety plan. And we have a presentation from staff for this as well. Okay, uh, evening commissioners. Again, my name is Brianna Byrne and I'll be presenting on the local road safety plan. Um, quick overview, we'll do some um, recap of the updates from last meeting and then moving into the collision profile findings and then next steps. So what is the local road safety plan? Uh, abbreviated to LRSP, it is a data-driven safe system approach to identify, analyze, and prioritize roadway safety improvements. Um, where traditionally improvements are made reactively to um, a collision, this takes a more proactive approach. Um, and ultimately, looking out to the future, this type of plan will be needed to um, apply for grant funding. When, so we're, as we kick off the discussion about collisions, uh, what are we talking about here? So on the left, we have kind of um, a little pyramid with the foundation, the, the majority being unsafe acts, moving all the way up to uh, the smallest portion of a, of a fatal injury. So when we say collisions in this um, presentation, we're, we're talking about what's an injury collision. So that's what's in the box. Um, and that includes death, serious accidents, and a portion of these minor accidents we see. Um, and another term is KSI, and these are killed or severely injured. And this is, again, the, the higher portion of this pyramid we see. Uh, and as a note, property damage uh, only collisions are not included. Um, here is a slide we presented uh, last week to really indicate uh, our, vulnerable, our vulnerable roadway users. So on the left, we have all injury collisions from 2015 to 2016 by mode of travel. So we have bicycle, vehicle, and pedestrian with um, you know, more than or 79% of these collisions involving vehicles. But when we look at uh, collisions that involved killed or severely injured um, persons, those vehicle collisions only count for half. Um, pedestrians account for significantly more and same with bicycles. So this collision data citywide was mapped and we have a heat map uh, that was shown last week um, and some trends are discussed on the left with arterial speeds being a main concern, left turns without a green arrow, uh, especially where we have intersections with a lot more cross traffic and then for the bike lanes, bike lanes on large, uh, on, on large arterials um, are a safety concern, especially when we get to intersections. And then timeline. So update one, we were at this gather and analyze the safety data. And update two, we're right before developing the countermeasures. So from the data, we created collision profiles. And that's what we're going to be presenting tonight. Um, and all throughout this um, process, we do have this stakeholder engagement portion down below. So the first profile we're going to discuss is uh, pedestrian collisions in the dark. So uh, there is a higher number of collisions in downtown, but few of these collisions were KSIs. Um, the KSIs were scattered more around the city and were primarily on poorly lit autocentric arterials. 35% uh, of all pedestrian collisions occurred at night and 60% of all killed or severely injured collisions happened at night. Looking at DUI, 7% um, of all of the city collisions um, were DUI related with, um, and of that 7%, 37 occurred on a weekday and 37% occurred um, in the daytime. And this is a trend not typical, where if we think about DUI-related collisions, we think um, evening 
or weekend. So this was a trend out of um, what's considered typical. And then looking at KSIs, uh, DUIs uh, result in 20% of all, of all KSIs. Um, large intersections with slip lanes. So slip lanes, um, an example would be YVR at Bancroft. It's where we have those channelized rights. Um, the right turns can go at high speeds. Um, and these large intersections with slip lanes are, you know, indication of vehicles going faster. So 19% of all collisions citywide happened at these types of intersections. And then 20% of all KSIs happened. And we see the breakdown here where um, you know, more than half of these KSIs were pedestrian, uh, few bicyclists, and then vehicles. So pedestrian crashes in residential neighborhoods. Um, as traffic volumes pick up, what were conventional or traditionally um, lower volume, slower speed roads um, are getting more volume. So 25% of all pedestrian KSIs occurred on these smaller arterial and collector streets. And bicycle crashes along large roadways. So this one, 71% of all bicycle collisions occurred on large multi-lane roads. Um, an example of this would be Oak Grove, um, wide road with just bike lanes. Um, and then of that 71%, 28% occurred on multi-lane facilities with bike lanes only. Unsafe speeds along large arterials. Uh, more than a quarter of all vehicle collisions citywide and 16% of all KSIs had speed-related issues. Large arterials near downtown, um, about 20% of all collisions we're near downtown, 22% of bicycle collisions near downtown, and 28% of pedestrian collisions. Um, and overall, this was about 8% of all KSIs. And then right-of-way violations at signalized intersections. So this can refer to, um, again, the green arrow, um, vehicle um, or pedestrian not yielding to the right-of-way, um, improper turning at intersections, so this accounted for 15% of all collisions, 15% of bicycle, and 12% of pedestrian. Uh, red light running, um, and this was a profile created out of stakeholder feedback that we got, where you know maybe collision records don't necessarily uh, reflect what's actually going on here, but there was some reported collisions here. So we had 7% of all KSIs were red light running, 13% of bicycle KSIs, and 5% of pedestrian. So within Walnut Creek, we have the Rossmore community. Um, and so we chose to create a Rossmore specific collision profile. So Rossmore Pacific, um, if we look at the heat map on the right, you can kind of see this gap in collisions um, where Rossmore is really kind of its island, an island of its own. So we included the Rossmore community as well as Tice Valley leading up to the community. Um, and the asterisk we have there is that the Rossmore streets are technically private, but they are Walnut Creek residents and providing this feedback to the community um, would, would ultimately help them. So within Rossmore, um, 57% of all KSIs had to do with right-of-way violations. Um, and 75% of all pedestrian KSIs were right-of-way violations. Um, and this does only include data up to 2021, and there have been incidences since then. So this data is, to clarify, since 2021. So moving on to next steps, we are in the develop countermeasures. So for each one of these profiles that we went over, uh, countermeasures, multiple um, countermeasures will be provided. And this will be kind of the, the roadmap to uh, pursuing funding and making these locations safer. 
We have several engagement opportunities and we are looking for feedback from the commission on any others that you think would be valuable. We are attending the Walnut Festival, um, doing an engagement booth on Friday from 5 to 11 p.m. Uh, we have an online survey and we've been collecting residential uh, resident information from residents who've been interested in providing feedback. Um, they will be sent the survey and we're growing this list of interested parties. But like I said, we are looking for more, um, any other opportunities as well. Oh, like we are considering um, reaching out to the Rossmore community and doing outreach there as well. And with that, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, at this time, do we have any questions from commissioners? Commissioner Reese? Um, I, I would, you had mentioned that you have to do the LS, LRSP in order to get grant, future grant funding. Um, is that for the new grant program that, that has come out? I think it's safe systems for all or something like that or yeah it's uh the safe uh safe streets for safe all streets grant for funding all. it's part of that iij um, infrastructure bill um but our our local road safety plan will meet the federal requirements for uh, what's called the safety action plan but it's basically the same thing just with a little extra oomph yeah. it will it will meet that that requirement okay. so we will be eligible great um, and then uh, the collision profiles, could you talk a little bit about what you're going to do with these? I, as I would, the, you know, we went through them pretty quickly. It looked like some of them were, I want to say, balanced, where the, the number of KSIs sort of aligned with the, the KSI associated with that particular profile and then there were other ones that looked really imbalanced where um, it looked like there were a lot more uh, uh, crashes with that profile and so I was wondering what do you do with the profiles now that you have them so once we so now that we've identified these profiles um, we're working with a consultant and they will come up with a list of countermeasures um, with an so let me go to an example we have here, with intersection with slip lanes. Um, so one example of a countermeasure here would be remove the slip lanes. Um, it reduces the speed. It reduces the conflict conflict points between drivers and pedestrians. Um, so identifying countermeasures for each one, and then specifically looking at how they would address where these KSIs fall. So uh, looking at this, is this telling me that, not that any KSIs are good, I, I want to make that clear, but it looks like 19% of all collisions are, um, occur at these locations and 20% of KSIs. So that looks, while it's unfortunate, it looks balanced. So is this a problem area or is is it yeah so the idea here is that we don't want any injury or severe like severe injury or or okay. killed collisions to occur so, ever right that's yeah. the ideal and so um you know when we're looking at this and again when what Brano was mentioning before when we're looking at the all collisions the the additional piece that's missing there is that it does include minor injury collisions so maybe you know like kind of like a strained neck type of thing uh -huh. um but what what the way you should interpret this is that one in five of the really bad collisions that are occurring in the city are happening at these locations okay. so if we were to try and get to zero you know, we can identify, well, what's the, what's the type of recommendation? That's the type of countermeasure, right? That we would apply at these types of locations and then we would do it across the board. So systemically, so we would, okay. we would apply that same treatment to all of the locations um, that have a similar characteristic. So the goal of this is to get to zero without having a vision zero action plan, but it's the goal 
here. That's the shift that we're making in safety versus what we did 10 or 20 years ago, is that we're really trying to get to zero. Is that a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Question? That's that. I apologize. It's I a, was, would you like to make that a question? Um, <laughs> yes, I would. Is is that the? I heard a question in there. Yeah. yeah. Is that the goal? I'm sorry. It yeah. was not a, formed as a question. Mm -hmm. No, that's a that's a great question. So part of the <laughs> <laughs> part of the comprehensive action that safety action plan uh, that's required by the feds mm -hmm. is that we are uh, required to have some kind of goal to x goal to zero goal to some kind of reduction in these types of of collisions by a set date and so we're really right now we're in like these preliminary findings and bringing it to you so that you can get this information as we're getting it from our consultant but ultimately, this is going to be a plan that is adopted by the council. It's going to be associated with a resolution that addresses that goal. Um, and then we will have to monitor and work to achieve that. And we'll have to show that progress, too. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner Salcido. So what... How how would these percentages, when, when you're breaking it down by pedestrians, cyclists, and vehicles, how does that index to how many people are participating in these different modes of travel? So, so I think um, maybe this isn't the best slide to show that, but maybe that first one that's like the greens the consultant slide that kind of shows the all versus the okay so so the way that we're trying to show show this information is that when you're looking at all the collisions that are occurring citywide and then looking at how like what kinds of collisions are occurring um, for the you know those severe ones you can see that disproportionately the the bicycles and the pedestrians are are impacted because ultimately it comes back to we talked about the safe system approach um, at our last uh, meeting and talking about momentum and mass and so and that kinetic energy and so when you're dealing with bicycles you're dealing with pedestrians they're they're going to be potentially overrepresented because they're going to be most severely impacted. Um, and then to that end, you know, in terms of quantity of pedestrians and cyclists, as opposed to the quantity of vehicles, I mean, we we know that there are fewer pedestrians and cyclists out there on our roads than the vehicles. And so that's when it really starts to um, hone in and, and drive home that point about that overrepresentation of those um, vulnerable road users. Um, and then do we know in terms of the uh, the cause of the KSI, what that pie chart would look like for who caused the KSI? <laughs> would that be 100% vehicles? It's, I mean, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it is really unlikely that a pedestrian or a bike collision occurred due to a pedestrian and bike interaction or a ped on ped interaction. It, I, like I said, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's probably all of the collisions we're talking about here. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then have, has the city of Walnut Creek uh, considered adopting vision zero as a, uh, Commissioner Reese uh, referenced. We have not brought that uh, concept of that policy to any commission, but since you are all talking about it, I think that is that is something that if you are interested in hearing more about, as we do need to meet some kind of goal, like I had mentioned, in order to meet that federal requirement for this plan, um, you know, starting to discuss that policy. And then one final question is, um, with these profiles, there's there's a lot of data, and I'm still kind of 
processing it in my own head, but what would would you say are the key takeaways from this presentation? Uh, key takeaways, we have large intersections and speeding vehicles. Those are the, the big highlights. And then th that interacts with people and it's not good. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, Vice Chair Ash, do you have anything? Okay. All right. Um, my question is kind of specific. I'm going back to the slip lanes. And um, uh, so some of this might be kind of situational, right? Like I'm thinking of, for instance, when you're going down Broadway and you're turning right onto Civic, um, there's a crosswalk there for those slip lanes. Okay, so drive down a little bit more and you get to Civic and YV, Ignacio Valley Road and there's no crosswalk there for those slip lanes. So pedestrians can't access that, I don't think, right? No, there's no crosswalk there. So um, situationally, I guess, um, are you looking at data around like when there's a crosswalk in the slip lanes versus when there isn't and that kind of a thing? Well, so just for clarification, um, so Civic, northbound Civic, as you approach Ignacio Valley Road, there's no slip lane there. Those are just right turn lanes. So the slip lane is when you have like a, oh. we call them pork chops too. Okay. It's like this little raised median island. So you're kind of crossing. You don't have a like a signal or anything like that. As a pedestrian, you can just cross, um, but you're only crossing against right turning vehicles who are channelized, um, which is different than you know just the actual right turn lane, which is just the paint with the okay. with the arrow. I'm sorry. I no, no, that's okay. That. No, that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I completely misunderstood that. So that's good to know. Okay, S scratch that question. I guess. <laughs> yeah, and so all of these locations have crosswalks across them. Yes, yeah. Okay, wonderful. All right. Thank you very much. Any other questions before we move to public comment? I don't see any. Okay. Do we have anybody in the queue for public comment? We have one, mem or one member of the public on Zoom. Okay. And is there anybody in the audience who wants to give public comment? No? Okay, uh, so if you're joining us by Zoom, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only. Uh, when you're brought in for comment, please state your name and city of residence for the record. You'll have two minutes to provide your public comment. Okay, I'm going to bring in Janine and Kevin. All right. Welcome Janine and Kevin, you're on. Oh, you know what, I think they might be the 916 number. So let me take a look at that. Oh, wait. Oh. How about now? Can we can hear you now. Can you guys hear us? Okay. Yes, we can hear you now. Um, great. So we are um, the property owners at 2436 Walnut Boulevard, which is directly across the street from uh, Walnut Creek Intermediate School. Um, I apologize for maybe skipping back to the previous um, agenda item. I don't know if we had a technical difficulty and didn't get our hand raised, um, but if we have a moment, I'd like to ask a few questions and provide some input on the um, Safe Routes to School program. Um, one question would be... Can I ask um, that, can you know, we can take comment on a previous item? Is that possible? We, we had a technical difficulty, so, but I don't, I'm not sure that we can, but we could have um, we could have this member of the public send in written comment and we could always publish it with the, with the meeting minutes. Okay. I don't want to do any Brown Act violations, obviously, or have any issues with the meeting. So if that, if that has to be the case, then that has to be the case. Otherwise, I'd, since we had a technical difficulty, I'd love to be understanding and give them the time. But if we can't, I understand. Okay. I don't know the answer to that. I also don't. <laughs> okay. 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 Then I think. Go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. Go. I'm. We're sorting this out. Bear with us, and thank you for your patience, Janine and Kevin. Please go ahead and um, provide your comments. Thank you. Um, the uh, or my comment is more so related to uh, key stakeholders. It seemed like most of the key stakeholders that were noted in the presentation uh, were PTA members, you know, administration, parents of you know, children going to school um, are 
members of the community that are immediately adjacent to these schools going to be included in the uh, you know community workshops or these these you know uh, you know kickoff sessions? Thank you very much for your question. And I think what I'll have you do is um, we'll have staff provide their email address and they can get back to you with the answer of the engagement that they're doing with the community, if that's all right. I'll um, just follow up with an email. It sounds like that's probably the best way to go about it. I think that would be great. Thank you very much. And thank you for your time being here tonight. Are there any other members of the public on uh, agenda item um, 4C? There are no more members of the public uh, wishing to comment on this item. Okay. We're going to move on to commissioner comments. Are there any comments from commissioners? Nope. Commissioner Reese? Um, so I had uh, three comments. I guess one of the highlights that I, it looked like is that you had, and I think you even mentioned this, higher speed roads. Uh, more KSIs, and I and you compared it to downtown, uh, which had a lot of uh, collisions, but less KSIs because I think because of the speeds, and I just think that we always hear that speed and kinetic energy, what you talked about last time, and how important it is, and how important it is to to reduce that, and I think your data. It sounds like your data is supporting the fact that if we just drove slower and uh, that, that that in and of itself would help. Um, and so going along those lines, I think that looking at um, speed limit setting and trying to maybe even have the city advocate for more flexible speed limit setting uh, at the state level since it's a state, require, a state issue. Um, doing those would be, I think, helpful and uh, might be good action items for your, your LRSP. Uh, the other one is that, uh, and this is a pet peeve of mine because when I ride my bike uh, or walking, uh, permitted left turns versus protected left turns, um, up until we had uh, crash modification uh, libraries we um, applied um, calculations to determine if there was a warrant met to put in a protected left turn. And I always, throughout, I've always felt that the warrant has nothing to do with me in the crosswalk or me riding my bike and getting whacked by somebody making a per permitted left that is looking for the cars and not for me on my bike or walking. And I would hope that um, the city in looking at recommendations would look at something like a permitted or a protected left turn and um, look at the, the, the safety benefits of the protected left and using things like that to support uh, would otherwise might not be in the manuals uh, for solutions to uh, transportation. Because what's in the manuals is still set on moving vehicles uh, and not moving people and not looking out for safety. Um, and the last item, um, Vision Zero, I, I think that on the face of it, I can see where um, the community and the city might say, well, it's ridiculous, we'll never get to zero. But really getting to zero is a philosophy. It's a philosophy that brings in all departments within the city, uh, Parks and Rec, uh, uh, the, the uh, senior transportation service that we heard about tonight, uh, police, uh, emergency services, hospitals, uh, libraries, it, it, the library commission, it brings in everybody and sets a mindset to really not accept crashes and really work to minimize crashes. And so the idea of going to zero on a practical sense might not be practical, 
but it's really about setting expectations in our community. And so I really feel that uh, I would really, I really feel that the city should move forward with uh, a Vision Zero philosophy. I'm glad to see that the feds are pushing that a little bit uh, with the way that they're setting up their new programs. Uh, but it would be great if if we as a city, as a holistic, as a group could uh, come together and say that these crashes are not acceptable and then uh, work as a team to uh, do what we can to uh, reduce and eliminate uh, crashes. Uh, thank you. Commissioner Salcido. Um, I'd just like to echo what Commissioner Reese said about Vision Zero, and I, I would really be interested in um, having a future presentation about that um, brought to the commission. Um, I also am just kind of uh, floored by some of these statistics and just the large percentage of KSIs that are pedestrians and cyclists, just knowing how small that number is of people I see walking and biking to places. I mean, everybody is a pedestrian at some moment in time, um, but uh, it, like the distant, a lot of those distances are not very far. Um, and so it's just heartbreaking, honestly, to see how many of these KSIs are, are, are bikes and pedestrians. Um, and it really does seem like the best thing that we can really do is to continue to work to incentivize and make it safer for people to take other modes of transportation that do not rely on a personal vehicle um, because that seems to be the main issue. Um, and I think some of that is uh, also just the way that we design our streets, which have historically been designed for cars um, in, in places like Walnut Creek, anyway. Um, and uh, it's interesting to see that in the downtown area, there might be more collisions, but they tend to be less severe because people are probably driving slower and there are more pedestrians around, so people are paying a little bit more attention, whereas in these other parts of the city, um, people just kind of take it for granted that the road is for cars, and, um, and it's harder to see um, a, to see people who are not in a vehicle, um, and uh, especially as someone who has been a pedestrian in a crosswalk, hit by a car, <laughs> not in Walnut Creek, um, but uh, it's uh, it's terrifying, and there's you have nothing to protect you. So um, I I'm glad we're investigating this and and looking into it, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for the city to to make significant changes. Thank you. Vice Chair Ash, do you have anything? I'll just echo the previous two, but I'll ask more specifically. I'd like to see um, it brought before this body to discuss and vote on a goal to recommend to the city council to take action. Um, so not if staff can identify maybe what some types of goals could be. Maybe it's multiple choice, I don't know what that is. And then we could discuss that and say, this is the goal we'd like the city to set. That to, I think, Commissioner Reese's point, it doesn't have to be zero deaths, right? That might be hard to achieve, but like maybe we could set what is a, a recommendation and ask the council to adopt that. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? All right, Youth Member Yao, you let us know if you want to say anything. Okay, we welcome your input. Um, I'll say that I, I like that we're um, doing this kind of alongside the Safe Routes to Schools because I think it builds that culture of um, less accidents and less KSI. So um, I think it'll be interesting to look at both, um, you know, that study and this plan side by side kind of too and how they might interrelate and that kind of a thing. So. Um, thank you for your work. I have no further comments other than um, agree with a lot of what my colleagues have said here today. Um, so thank you. And I think that wraps up this item. Um, we will move on to traffic signal school, mm -hmm. item 4D. <laughs> 
This is our traffic signal education part three. Staff is coming up to give us a presentation. Commissioners are eating candy. <laughs> no, it's good. That's what it's there for. <laughs> Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening. I know La Scala is still open. You guys are bringing your A game. You guys fill up on coffee before you come here? <laughs> that was great, great discussion. Uh, this one is uh, not as serious and uh, just bringing some items of technology related to the intersection um, to kind of, uh, again, just to educate and uh, get your input, feedback. Um, I should say uh, we're not necessarily pursuing these technologies. These are technologies that exist that are on our radar um, that we try to uh, you know, include in projects or consider otherwise. Um, so these are the five technologies tonight. Um, we'll just run through them and kind of give a, a brief overview. Uh, I'm not going to go too in depth on them, uh, mainly because I don't know them that well, but also because of time. Um, so the first one's adaptive te signal technology. Uh, the second one is arterial traffic signal performance measures. Uh, the third one is uh, passive pedestrian detection. Uh, the fourth one is LIDAR detection. And the fifth one is uh, near collision video analytics, also called near miss. Uh, the top right, I have a picture of a skipping stone. That's kind of the overview here. We're just going to be kind of touching the surface of a lot of these, not going too deep. Um, we. I do also want to touch that we do have some existing signal technologies. Uh, again, we're not covering these tonight, but these exist in the city already. Um, future updates could be provided on these, but basically closed captioned uh, pan tilt zoom cameras. Uh, we have about 30 of those at our intersections um, for live viewing. Uh, we also have video detection cameras. Uh, we have fiber optic going in just from City Hall to uh, YVR, Ignacio Valley Road and Civic. Small leg, but more soon. Uh, we also have Bluetooth travel time devices that measure some travel times. And uh, we also use uh, responsive signal timing. So this is a coordinated timing plan that we use, but it's modified during the day based on traffic volumes. Oh. So um, here's our template for tonight. So this is how uh, I'll run through the different five technologies. So the technology name will be on the left, and then I'll have a definition at the top. Uh, I'll try to explain what the issue is solving, and then a brief uh, line about how it works. Um, and then I'll have a follow-up slide of maybe some pro and cons, maybe some more examples, that kind of thing to kind of get the point across. Um, so jumping into the first one here, adaptive signal control. Um, so we talked all about um, signal timing and coordination, making sure that the lights uh, turn green at the same time. So this is a, a more advanced signal timing operation that uses uh, basically a central computer to monitor what's going on on the roadways and to adjust signal timing based on the traffic. Um, so this is really used mainly uh, when you have uh, event releases, like a big stadium. You, you could think of like a, a big football game getting out and you just want to flood traffic through. Um, or road closures or collision events or emergency evacuations where you just have peak, peak demand that you want to adjust the existing signal timing to accommodate that. Um, and so this works by adjusting the cycle lengths, the splits, as well as the offsets uh, to coordinate an efficient traffic movement. Uh, and it, it updates, uh, you know, every five to 15 minutes kind of thing. So really cycle by cycle every couple minutes, it's adapting to what the traffic conditions are. Uh, so here's, um, you really, so for, to set this up, you have to have some base timing plans, um, and then it's going to modify your splits, your offsets, and your cycle lengths from that based on certain detectors on your network. So here you can see um, a blue car coming down Ignacio Valley Road towards 680, going westbound. Uh, now there's a lot of cars, and this, so they turn, they're essentially triggering these traffic detectors uh, more frequently. And so that can send information further down the roadway, downstream, 
that there's more cars coming. And so it can request that early green phase to trigger. So that's one example of how this, you know, this technology uses. Now, in terms of studies, I found a published study that said uh, it improved the um, like travel times by you know about 5%, uh, but the performances weren't stati statistically significant. So I don't know if they had enough data, data captured on the after study to, to really prove it. But you know, compared to coordination, uh, it's definitely, you can see improvements, but uh, it's hard to really get 50% uh, you know, improvement off, off your roadways. Um, so it's, it's, it's more of a minor tweak. Um, and then it's not set it and forget it because you're relying on detectors giving you information on the roadway and you have to have communications back to your uh, uh, central ser server. Um, and so you really gotta make sure that those are operating functionally. So if those go down, those need to be replaced um, to, to keep your system up and running. Um, the second technology here is uh, automated traffic signal performance measures or ATSPMs or SPMs for short. Um, so this is one of the first technologies I actually wanted to present on, but I kind of did a background with two other presentations to kind of give you the basis for uh, traffic signal operations. Um, so this is a software that generates um, reports uh, based on the phase and detector information that's going on at the intersection. Um, so what this does is can provide up-to-date signal performance and insights related to maintenance, maintenance efficiency, as well as safety. Um, and so this, is, this happens with a local log on the controller. It logs the data uh, every tenth of a second, and it uh, captures the phase and detection information, and then it produces uh, appeasing visible, visible gra visual graphs and charts. So here's an example of one on the right. Uh, there's, there's many of them, but this is one I'll kind of walk through. Um, so you can imagine you get a green phase and a yellow phase and a red phase. Um, and we talked about an all red phase about a second. So this is just showing the yellow and the red, all red phase. And then the, red, the lighter red is for an opposing phase green. So essentially, you're looking at a light, you hit the yellow and then th the red. Um, and there's little dots on there that are showing detector actuations, which shows a, a vehicle approaching. So what this is saying that people are running the yellow light with those little um, detector actuations. Um, and this is through a time of day on the left and right. So this is like one full day. You can also see some detector actuations going through on the all red. Um, and so this is kind of one of the safety elements that you can glean insights to. And this is just a particular phase for one particular day, but you could imagine you know, looking, looking longer term and more phases. Um, so this technology was developed out of uh, Purdue University in, in coordination with India DOT, Indiana DOT, um, and they made it. In, they published it in 2012. Uh, UDOT has since uh, Utah Department of Transportation has since uh, released open source software that essentially gives you this. Um, and then other agencies have, or other um, companies have taken that open source software, created a commercial product um, that are available on the market today. So uh, this technology really just collects, uh, you know, vehicle counts, pedestrian calls, uh, the phases, and the detectors all at once, and combines them so that you can see them in in these uh, in insightful graphs. Um, so there's 14 official metrics that were published. Um, these are them. I showed you one of them on the previous slide. There. Uh, there's also turning movement counts you can get. Uh, there's approach delay, there's also pedestrian delay, so you can imagine when you go and press the button, how long does it take for you to see the pedestrian walk sign? What's that delay that pedestrians see? Um, you can also um, get approach speed or uh, just how your coordination is performing, among others. Uh, the third one here tonight is uh, passive pedestrian detection. So uh, you could imagine not pressing the, the pedestrian button uh, and having a sensor be detecting pedestrians before, uh, automatically, essentially. So uh, at the curb ramp before crossing the crosswalk, you'd automatically be detected. Um, so this calls the pedestrian phase without any action by the user. It's obviously pretty nice. Um, and uh, there's also another aspect where if the sensor is, in, is facing the crosswalk, uh, you could limit the unused crosswalk time when pedestrians finish crossing. Um, so essentially, a sensor is facing the curb ramp um, or the crosswalk and it automatically uh, detects if a person's there and puts in a call for them. Um, and when it does face the, uh, I'll, I'll cover, cover this in the next slide. 
Um, so here, this is a crossing in Walnut Creek here on the Iron Horse Trail in Walden. Uh, this is county installed, but this is a passive sensor that essentially just starts blinking and lighting up when a user is approaching the crossing. Um, so typically there's uh, thermal sensors that are used here to detect uh, users, um, which can help, are more accurate for pedest detecting pedestrians, people uh, on bikes, and uh, less inclined to weather and lighting. Um, so you can also take this technology and apply it to the crosswalk. So if someone is in the crosswalk, to ensure that they uh, do not run out of crossing time. Um, so you could imagine in our, some of our longer crosswalks, uh, Treat and Cherry, California Pringle, Ignatia Valley Road in Maine. These are some of our longest crosswalks that we've measured. Um, and so providing a shorter crosswalk time for them, but then extending it to uh, a longer time if a pedestrian is still in the crosswalk. So this goes back to the point that an intersection is a box, and if you have someone waiting to use that box, uh, to make sure that inside the box is being used. If it's not, give it to someone else. So the same thing applies for vehicles, which is pretty well done, but for pedestrians, if someone only needs 20 seconds to cross and we're giving them 35, uh, this technology could essentially be used to allow to shorten that. Um, the fifth technology here is uh, LiDAR detection. So you probably heard about LiDAR. It's one of the uh, common almost buzzwords now with autonomous vehicles. Um, and essentially, uh, this is a processed laser light that uh, can detect distances of objects uh, at an intersection. So um, it can detect vehicles, bikes, pedestrians uh, at the stop bar as well as as far away as a approach of about a few hundred feet. Um, and then this will generate a point cloud of all these distances and create objects uh, that you can see, like in the example up on the top left. Um, and it shows these measured distances um, essentially from a sensor that's mounted at the intersection. So you can see, okay, so we're gonna kind of break apart LIDAR here um, in terms of how it fits into the traffic detection realm. Um, so we have found our top common usages on the top from radios, microwaves, infrared, and visible light. Now, uh, basically traffic has used all these different forms of the um, spectrum to create some sort of detection technology. So LIDAR is just another element of this. Um, from radio waves, we have radar, microwaves, we have microwave sensors, thermal imaging, we have um, uh, infrared, we have thermal imaging. Um, iPhones now have LIDAR on them, and now we're seeing that at the intersection. Uh, we always had visible light, and now we, and we have video cameras as well. So this is just one aspect of the spectrum, um, and it's just below visible light, as you can see there. Um, so here's a, a graphic showing uh, kind of what, what's generated from LiDAR. You can see it's a pretty high resolution. You can make out objects and that kind of thing. But um, I will say that it is experimental right now. Um, it's mainly uh, pilot installations uh, with like startup companies that are kind of interested in this space. Essentially, they're looking for different aspects to apply LiDAR to besides autonomous vehicles, and the intersection is one of them. Um, so how it would work would be two sensors kind of diagonally opposed each other, getting a wide view, maybe two approaches each of an intersection. Um, we do have some limited vertical resolution, uh, just the way the sensor is, but really good uh, horizontal cross rev resolution from the sensor. Um, and it can be great for object detection. Lighting is not a problem because it essentially provides its own light with the LiDAR, um, and then it can uh, penetrate weather pretty well as well. Um, the last uh, technology here I'll be covering tonight is uh, near collision video analytics. Uh, this is a growing space in the ITS field, in the uh, technology field here in traffic. So essentially this is a wide angle camera that's installed at an intersection, usually temporarily, um, and the video is analyzed um, for near collisions between uh, different users of the intersection. Uh, so this identifies possible hotspots about where a modification to the intersection may be warranted. Um, and then, uh, so essentially it records a bunch of video and then it processes it. Uh, and you can see the trajectories about w where there was almost a collision. Um, and then that may have not ever been reported otherwise. So uh, you can see here the, um, the top right, an image of, uh, you know, there, there's no um, collision report for this event here. 
Um, and if we look at our uh, triangle, which we saw earlier in, uh, tonight, um, you can see you know, unsafe acts and near miss. This is kind of where we're capturing with this technology that we wouldn't know otherwise. Um, so it kind of captures that long tail of events uh, that go on at the intersection. Um, there is a cost associated with it, and deploying it uh, for longer periods of time and at multiple intersections can obviously as well incre increase cost. Um, but overall, uh, it seems very promising. Um, and if you notice on the, on the left side of that triangle, there's lagging indicators. So as you go up higher, you're essentially getting information after the fact, after it already happened. Um, and then as you go down, uh, you can essentially get leading information. So information that you know, may lead to a bigger issue. Um, so we're trying to, this, this technology essentially tries to capture that before um, it becomes a bigger, a bigger issue. Um, here's a video of just essentially, you know, kind of an action. There's no accident or anything or near miss in this or near collision. Um, it just kind of shows you that the, um, the analytics working um, from, a, from a video angle. So um, that's all. I'll leave it open back to comments and questions. Okay, thank you. Any questions from commissioners? Yes, youth member Yao. Oh yeah, so um, I know you found like statistics for, I know the adaptive signal control for like um, requesting a green light and you said like that the uh, statistics, it wasn't like a big change. But I also wanted to know like aside from what you found online, were there any statistics within our community about like the percentage of how these uh, five technologies have improved our transportation? Thanks. So yeah, these these technologies aren't currently being used in the city, um, but uh, I imagine they would they would make some improvements. I imagine they'd help. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. I I think that's it for questions. I don't um, have any questions. Uh, at this time, is there any public comment? There are no members of the public who wish to provide comment. Okay. Um, so we'll open it up to comments from commissioners. Commissioner Reese. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, so uh, I really appreciate the information. Um, I'm intrigued about the near miss technology. I know that um, it's proprietary as far as how they calculate and determine what a near miss is, and so it's really in its infancy. Um, but I would encourage you to just monitor uh, the technology and see, be open to flexibility as to whether or not you might be able to incorporate the technology or when you upgrade video detection, when you consider the fiber think about how you might be able to install this equipment on a more of a permanent basis uh, to be able to just continuously monitor near misses uh, for, I'm, I'm thinking of the major corridors as, as one of the areas that um, I think we, we really don't understand how close people come to being injured in crashes. And this is one way to get there, but it's also right now very expensive to deploy. So I, I'm not advocating for it to be deployed now, but definitely keep track of it and think about it as you move forward and upgrade your systems. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, so this has been great. I appreciate you putting together all three parts. It's, it's thank you. Um, so I think every time I've talked about the Ignacio commute and how to deploy this there. So um, I've been paying attention to my commute times, taking it pretty much every day from Oak Grove, so the far end of where the traffic starts on it, to either Oakland 24 or 680. Um, and I consider a as fast as I could get there is eight minutes. So I don't expect that always, but I just want to share this so you have one person's data. Um, you can't really make it faster than eight minutes. Um, I would say the average time is 11 to 13 with the morning commute. And the morning commute, let's say, is between 7.30 and 8.30. 
um, I'm hitting about 14 to 18 minutes. And then there was one time at eight o'clock at night where it took 27 minutes and that was not because of an accident or anything. That was literally because I hit every single light for like the maximum time. Um, and I think you were in the control booth at that time watching me and <laughs> manipulating it. That's a case we'll, we'll talk further, but, um, so I just wanted to, to share like, what is that average commute? I don't know, like if you have actually timed goals for the synchronization. Um, but I think, you know, anything in that 11 to 13, I think most people are ideal. I think that 16 minute during, uh, that morning commute is good, but anything getting past 16, I think that's where you'll have people just aggravated no matter what time of day it is. Mm -hmm. Just sharing. Yeah, no, that's really good. And we are conducting a uh, retiming of Ignacio Valley Road um, with uh, some funds from MTC. So, um, and with that, we do before studies. So essentially we have people drive it and record uh, with a GPS that, you know, logs exactly how long it took between the between one start of the corridor, end of the corridor. Um, so we get that before study, we retime, we do the same thing after, collect after studies. So then we can see that comparison. Usually there is a, a trend that, you know, shows improvements. Um, that's for the corridor. It's not talking about the minor streets. So that's something to consider. Um, but yeah, your data is, uh, your data is interesting and it's good baseline. Yeah. And at CCTA, we, uh, since I'm a representative there, I will often bring up the, um, cross city, uh, coordination going, you know, that Ignacio is also Kirker pass and, and everything else. And you're bringing in four or five, seven city residents coming in through our city um that that you know that signal coordination has to be engaging all of those other entities not just here so. okay any other comments all right oh yes please i was gonna say like it was really interesting to learn about like all this technology and like interesting to see how technology is just being developed and improved and the possibilities of it being used to improve communities. And just like all this seems so futuristic, so I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, the future of the technology. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I'll just say thank you so much for this report and the education, we appreciate it. And I'm especially intrigued by some of the passive pedestrian uh, detection technology, um, especially as a regular pedestrian, sometimes like making your BART train I, I mean, like hitting the button in time to actually cross, you know, the street, like can make a d big difference in making a train or not sometimes. Um, anyway, I, I, I would love to see us look more into that technology as well, as we're trying to get people out of their cars as well. Just whatever we can do to make that more convenient, right? Yeah. So anyway, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we'll wrap up that agenda item and head to agenda item five, which is commissioner's announcements and brief reports on activities. Um, does anyone have anything to share? All right, I see nothing. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> staff, please. Oh. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick update. We. Um, currently have under construction on Lennon Lane, there was a repaving project that also included um, North Viamonte, uh, but the Lennon Lane improvements actually include um, protected bike lanes or separated bikeways. Uh, we're using the, it's like white posts and paint um, application, or actually it's, yeah, the the same type of posts that we have on Bancroft currently. So Bancroft technically is our first class four bikeway, but it's a very, very short stretch. Lennon Lane is actually the full uh, length of that street, so it gets you up to Kaiser. It was kind of our first um, dipping the toe into the water of the implementation of the Shadelands multimodal plan. So I'm looking forward to uh, people trying it out in the next couple of weeks and we'll follow up with an email uh, when it is done so Wonderful. you can all try it out great thank you all right seeing nothing else uh we'll adjourn the september 15th 2022 regular meeting of the transportation commission and our next meeting is scheduled for no november 17th 2022 see you then
thank you.